Good morning. How many of you, for, for how many of for you, was that enough dad jokes to keep you through the entire week? You don't need any more, right? Yeah. Um, I thought those were kind of cute. Since us dads get accused of telling bad jokes, I figured I'd just flood you with them and see how you reacted. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed that a little bit. We're hoping today will be a fun day. Happy Father's Day to all of you who are dads, and uh, hopefully... Uh, today, this can be a time when we can honor the one who sets the example for all of us parents, and that is, of course, God, our Savior. Let's stand together. And we're going to start out with a couple of familiar songs. This one, um, hopefully this older hymn, is one that you'll know and remember. Sing with us. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme.
another. Make the people around you feel welcome. As soon as you're done greeting, you're welcome to be seated for just a moment. And uh, we are going to take up our morning tithes and offerings. And uh, again, just a reminder, as always, that uh, if you don't have your offering here this morning, you're welcome to give online as well. And there's lots of information everywhere about how to do that. So let's have our ushers come forward at this time. And as they come, let's ask God's blessing on this offering. Father, we come before you today and we just thank you for allowing us to come and, and celebrate you and celebrate Lord, the example that you give us of how to be not only a father but a parent, how you uh, taught us about unconditional love and, and about leading a, a group of people. And, Father, we know that um, dads in this day and age have a hard task before them. I pray that today you would not only help the dads to feel welcome and honored, but, Father, that more than anything we would honor and glorify your name as well. As we give of our tithes and offerings now, um, allow these gifts to go to the good of your kingdom we pray that we would always, as a church, be good stewards with what we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, North Avenue Church, I am Pastor Brian, and I have a few announcements I want you to know about. We have a couple of donation opportunities that are going to be ending today. One of them is the items for the In As Much House bags that we're making for the kids who live at the In As Much House. And second is the diaper drive. So if you have either of those that you still want to donate, make sure you run home in between services or after the service and bring them back as soon as possible. Our first student ministry lunch club is this Wednesday from 12 to 4. We're going to come together, eat lunch, do a service project, and end with something super awesome and fun. So if you are going into sixth grade or anywhere in high school, you guys are welcome to come. It's going to be great. This Wednesday, we will be filling in as much bags with all the items that the church has donated and we'll be delivering them to the in as much house. So it's going to be great. You want to make sure you're there. The fourth Thursday breakfast is coming up this week at 8.30 at Lux Cafe. So if you want to eat breakfast with a bunch of awesome people, make sure you're there. All people are welcome. And if you have any questions, you can ask Sue Densham. This Saturday at 10 a.m. is another hike at Ott Biological Preserve. It's going to be awesome. You definitely want to be there if you can make it. If you do want to go, make sure to talk to Erica Gothberg and she can get you all the information that you need. After you do the hike, we got an awesome opportunity to go eat some dinner together at Core Bistro at 5 o'clock. There's going to be a sign-up sheet in the lobby today, so make sure to sign up so we know how many people to do the reservation for. Women at North are having an ice cream and sunset night on June 30th at 6.30 at Don Fortin's house, which is this address right here. It's going to be great, but men cannot go, unfortunately. But if you are a woman and you want to be there, all women are welcome. And it's a great time to just fellowship and eat ice cream and have a good time. And if you want to bring a topping to put on top of the delicious ice cream that will be provided, feel free to do that. 
our Fulfilling the Vision campaign is going awesome. Guys, thank you so much for everyone who has pledged money towards that. We're going to be able to do so many more things when we can pay off our mortgage. But we do want your input on what those funds will go towards when we have this money um, in front of us that we can use to, to bless our community and bless our church. So if you want some input in that, we're going to have many opportunities for you to get in small groups to give your input on what you think that would be best used for. So watch this next week and in the coming weeks for sign-up sheets so you can sign up to give us your voice. Thank you so much for listening to our announcements today. If you have any other um, questions, you can always call our church or you can go online at our website at northavenue.church. And if this is your first time with us today, we are very, very excited that you decided to join us. We'd love to get to know you a little bit more. And one way that we can do that is by you filling out the connect card in the back of the pew and turning that into a welcome center. We'd love to get your name, get to know you a little bit and give you a gift. Thank you for joining us today. As you can tell, I kind of didn't even refer to it because I've kind of gotten used to all the stuff on the platform. Uh, how many of you expected it would be gone this week, right? Nobody. Good, because it's not. After Thursday and we were done, uh, we did the very best that we could to get it in shape so we could use it this morning, but it will be coming down this week. If anyone needs a giant rock formation for your living room or your den, talk to us. We might be able to make a deal. You know, you could take it with you, throw it in your trunk, whatever. What do you think, Jenny? Ten bucks? Takes it all? Okay, yeah. The cactus is a little more expensive because Jenny put a ton of time into those. those. Those cactuses deserve a round of applause, in my opinion. Don't you think? Those started out as four by eight sheets of two inch fiber, uh, styrofoam, not fiberglass, styrofoam, and, and she turned them into that. That's pretty amazing stuff, let me tell you. So anyway, I, I know we do know that it's up here. If some of you think we just kind of forgot or we're going to leave it here forever, we're not going to do that. But we did have a great week at Bible school, and I just want to thank everybody who was a part of that. We had lots of, lots of help, lots of people coming in and just saying, how can I help? And um, it was a fantastic week, lots of kids. And the closing program, we had more parents here than I think I've seen at a Bible school closing in a long, long time. So it was a great experience. I want to invite you to sing a song with me this week. I, um, I kind of planned this song not really knowing who it was for, but um, I got a call from Sharon Cooper yesterday. I got a, a voicemail message, actually. I haven't called her back yet. I need to do that today. But apparently Steve is getting close. Um, they're saying that he maybe has a week to live. And so um, one, of the, one of the things that um, I guess as I thought through the worship today, this song it's kind of like one of those songs that introduces not a prayer time where we're going to be quiet and somber, but one that is one where we're going to ask boldly for some big things. And so if you don't know this song, I have done it a few times, although everybody on the worship team claims they've never heard it before in their lives, but Jenny knew it, so I'm, I'm saved. Um, learn it with us. So let's stand together and let's sing this together. It's just one that gives us the assurance that God can do anything, and that's what we need. That's what we need to believe today, and that's what the um, Coopers need to hear. Right now, anything can happen. Right here, everything can change. It is time, cast all your cares upon Him. Right here, right now, no fear. Don't just run into his presence just know he's got every single tear be cleansed in the holy reign of jesus right here right now no fear just to
Fear not, for he is good. Fear not, for he is God. Just look to the Savior, for he has overcome it all. Fear not, for he is good. He's higher than the mountains that I face. He's stronger than the power of the grave. He's constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains. Sing that verse again. Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave. He's constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains. One.
before you today, Lord, believing that there is nothing in this world that could ever change your love for us. And God, even at times when things are difficult for some of the ones that we love, as is the case today with the Cooper's family, we just, Lord, we know that your love for them hasn't changed regardless of what the circumstances are in their life this morning. And Father, we've prayed for Steve for a long time. There have been several times that we thought that his journey was coming to an end, and yet you've brought him back Lord, today we know that you still have the pow power to do that. And Lord, if it be your will, we pray that that would happen. We know that Steve is, has been faithful. He served you well. He knows you, and he's waiting for a, an eternity in paradise with you. But God, we ask that, that you would give that family um, a touch of your love and the hope that we have in Christ. We pray that if it be your will, that Steve would bounce back yet again and confound the doctors yet again. Lord, we don't know what it will take, but you do, for you are the great physician. And so, God, we trust you that in Steve's situation, you're going to do what is best for him and for his family, and that through it all, you're going to walk through that whole situation with them. Father, we just thank you for all that you're going to do, and we trust you. Lord, I want to lift up the Bechtel family, too. Um, Lord, Tony needs your healing touch right now, and Frank needs your strength to, to take care of her. Father, there's such a, I don't even know how to describe them. They have been literally parents to so many of the people in this church, even though they weren't related. They've taken people under their wings. They've guided people along. They've encouraged and helped and all of those things. I pray now, Lord, that you would give them that same encouragement that they've been giving to others over the years. God, I just pray that you would bring healing to Tony so that she can be back up and around again doing the things that she loves to do and getting into her garden and all of that. Lord, we pray that you would just bring back the, the immobility that this stroke has left her with. God, we just ask for your healing touch. Lord, you've commanded us that we're to come before you as children would ask their parents for a good gift. And Lord, that is the gift that we want today. That's the Father's Day gift I want. Just bring healing to her body so she can be back with us again. Lord, there are many others that are sick, um, that are not feeling well today. It seems like during Bible school every day we had a kid going home with this or that. And Lord, we know that sickness is a part of our lives. But Lord, we pray that you would just watch over those who are especially at risk and keep them safe from the germs that are floating around out there. And God, we trust you and we thank you and we praise you for the way that you've carried us through this difficult time with COVID. And Lord, as we look forward to a day when that word doesn't have to be on our lips all the time, uh, we know that you're going to carry us through the next thing as well. We trust you. We believe in you. And we know that your love will never fail us. Father, during Bible school, every time Pastor Brian would say something true, the people would yell, awesome God, or the children would yell, awesome God. And I think a few of the adults did it too. 
And it was so awesome to see people affirming the truth like that. I pray that you would help us as we go through our day today and as we go through our lives that when we hear truths, and when we hear someone speak a truth about you, that we might either out loud or even to ourselves just say, God, you're an awesome God. And as we hear statements like, your love will never fail us, that we might say, God, you're just such an awesome God. When we hear somebody testify that you've healed them, that we might in our minds and our hearts and maybe even out loud say, God, you're such an awesome God. Lord, there is power in affirmation. And I pray that you would help us as adults to learn what the kids did this week. And that is that when we hear the truth, we should affirm it vocally, verbally, and certainly with our lifestyles. God, give us the same kind of excitement in this church that I saw um, in Bible school week. And yes, we had to pull it out of them a few times. (laughs) But Lord, you were good and you were there. Thank you for that. God, lead us now through the rest of this time of worship as we have a little bit of fun with dads and as we open your word a little bit and hear a message from you that will be short, hopefully, and will help us to move on with the rest of our day. But Lord, we ask that as we hear these things and as we celebrate you once again, that you would just lead our hearts where you need them to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So during my sermon, I better hear some awesome gods come out of you people. That's all I'm saying. You, be, you can be seated. Gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome to another dad battle. Now is anybody, and I mean anybody at all, willing to face our champion? son joined the golf team at school, so I bought him an extra pair of socks in case he gets a hole in one. Oh. 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 Hole in one. His dad jokes are so effortless. See that? That's why he's the champ. That's nothing. The other day, My daughter said a good Christian dad would buy her a car. So I said, well, a good Christian kid would walk, because that's what Jesus did. Son, just because God picked your nose doesn't mean you should. When you start paying the bills, you can make some of the rules. Come on! Hold up! Who touched the thermostat? That lawn isn't gonna mow itself. Let me stop what I'm doing and fix your boredom. Hi, hungry. I'm dad. I love the smell of Home Depot in the morning. (laughs) Just wait till your mother gets home. (laughs) Pull my finger. (laughs) Nah. Just rub some dirt on it. Proud of you. You can do hard things. I love you, no matter what. When God made you, He made something very special. The proudest day of my life is the day you made me a father! 
I thank God for you every time I get on my knees and pray. Oh, not again. Who gives this woman? No. 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 no, you look at me. You look at me. Who gives this woman to, to be married to this man? Her mother and I do. I can't tell. There I am. For those of you that don't know, we do that on a we, we do that on a regular basis. Us dads, we get together and no, we don't. I'm kidding. It's a joke. Um, I just thought that was fun. Did you think that was fun? I didn't hear a lot of chuckles. I didn't know if some of you need to watch it two or three more times, maybe because I thought it was hilarious. Um, you know, being a dad is more than about just rattling off some cliche sayings that dads quote unquote always say. How many of you can think of something right now that your dad probably said more than one time, maybe he said it all the time? How many of you can think of one saying like those that, that he always said? Let me just give you a clue. If some of you people would listen when we say it the first time, we wouldn't have to say the same thing every day of our lives, right? I'm getting a little ornery there with you because my children, you know, they're like, dad, you always say the same thing. Well, then hear it the first time. Dads, can I get a witness? I know the dads are the non-expressives here, but give me some encouragement a little bit. All right. Anyway, listen, this week I, um, I was trying to think about, you know, what to share for Father's Day. And believe it or not, this doesn't often happen to me, but a dream actually influenced what I wanted to talk about today. I, I don't put a lot of stock in dreams. I know in the Old Testament they did, and in the story of Joseph, which we just went over with the kids during Bible school, dreams were kind of a central part of his faith and his life with God. But honestly speaking... I have only ever had um, two dreams that ever came true that, you know, I dreamed it and it happened, and both of them had to do with my car breaking down. So I'm thinking to myself, probably, God, if you were going to choose to speak through dreams and visions, it wouldn't be just to warn me that the seat post of my car is about to be free swinging and underneath me and have nothing to sit on anymore, because that's what happened to me. Anyway, so I've only had those two dreams, but this week I had a dream, and it just kind of made me stop and think. Um, it was a nightmare. How many of you have nightmares from time to time? Anybody willing to admit that? I hate, I hate having bad dreams. I don't like nightmares. And you might be surprised to find that my nightmares don't often involve any kind of monsters or even me being afraid of anything. Nine times out of ten, if I have what I'm going to call a bad dream or a nightmare, it has nothing to do with Freddy Krueger or anything imaginary. It usually centers around one theme. And the theme that my dreams, my bad dreams, usually center around is me trying to do something or get something done or prop somebody up or, or do something for someone and not being able to do it. It drives me crazy. Like, for instance, I've had dream after dream after dream where I'll get up to preach a sermon and all of a sudden my sermon notes aren't in front of me or I start preaching and there's something else going on in the room and everybody just wanders off and pays attention to that and instead of hearing my sermon. Or I'll dream that I'm getting ready to lead worship and all of a sudden my guitar strings all break at once and I, I'm strumming the guitar but no music's coming out. Or, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll dream about, you know, trying to build something and, and you know, those of us that can't do it we just dream about it right and I, I I'm trying to build something and I just can't get anything to hold and it all falls down but this particular dream this week that I had earlier this week I woke up and I told my wife I said that was the worst dream I'd ever had and it just it left me with this feeling in the pit of my stomach it just made me feel awful and I I tell you the the truth I kind of wanted to go back to bed and see if I could do better you know and wake up a little better than that but it had to do with this I was trying to get a ball team somewhere I don't know if it was a basketball team some of the 
girls from our softball team that I just got done coaching were there. But I was in my car, and I'm trying to get them to a game on time. And everybody's depending on me. I'm the assistant coach. I'm the guy who shows up carrying the stuff, you know. The head coach goes on ahead. He's got everything handled. And I'm the guy that's got to get the rest of the team there because, you know, this year we didn't have busing. So I think that's probably what prompted this. So anyway, I'm in my car, and I'm pushing the accelerator, and the car won't go. And this is just kind of how the dream went. And then I'm, you know, finally get the car to go, and I'm trying to put in my GPS because nobody knows where they're going anymore unless they put it in their GPS, right? And I can't get my fat, dumb fingers to put in the right thing, and the GPS just keeps putting in the wrong address, and I can't find it. And I finally hand the phone to my wife. To, to figure out and navigate, which tells you it was a dream right there, because that would never happen in real life, ever. No man would ever hand over navigation duties to their spouse. It's just never going to happen. But anyway, I handed it off to my wife, and, and all of a sudden, we finally got the car to go forward. I'm looking at my watch the whole time, thinking, oh, we're going to be so late. The coach is going to be so disappointed. And it was one of those dreams where when you're driving, all of a sudden, I'm going way faster than I should be going. And suddenly, the image in the dream changed from me driving down a highway to, like, speeders from Star Wars, you know, where I'm literally just flying at some ridiculous rate of speed, and I end up with the Suburban in a pond, soaking wet. Water's pouring in the floorboards, and I'm screaming at the girls, get out, get out, get out. And then I push the truck out of the pond onto dry land. Again, which shows you that's a dream, because I would have swum to shore and left them all there. That's what I would have done, but I'm kidding. I wouldn't really. But it's just wacky, stupid stuff. And then, of course, as I go to start it, I'm like, I got it out of the pond. Maybe I can start it. And as soon as I go to start it, it's no longer my suburban. It's our church bus down there, which I would never even drive. There's too many mice in there. It's just this crazy, ridiculous dream. And I woke up with this feeling in the pit of my stomach. And it was the feeling that I get a lot of times when I have one of these kind of nightmares. It's a feeling of, and some of you may be able to identify with this, not being enough. You ever felt that way? You know, you try and you try and you try and you try and you just can't get there. You just can't figure it out. You just can't meet the expectations of the people around you. And, and oftentimes, my nightmares revolve around that whole idea. Now, some of you are already starting to psychoanalyze me based on my dreams. Don't do that. Let's just hear it for what it is. And if this isn't your issue, then just, you know, nudge the person next to you and just say, he's talking to you today, all right? But for, for some reason... These bad dreams that I have, and, and again, they come in all different shapes and sizes, leave me with this feeling like I'm just not enough. And I think probably a lot of us struggle with that. Not just dads, but other people. But I, I think us dads especially feel this pretty deeply at times because, you know, we're supposed to be the ones that know stuff. We're supposed to be the ones that know stuff that nobody else wants to know so that other people can come to us to get things handled and to get things fixed. We're kind of the fixers of the family. We're the ones that are supposed to understand the workings of things that, that again, no one else understands or even wants to understand. And to be perfectly honest, I don't want to understand most of this stuff. I don't want to know how to go downstairs to the furnace when it chooses not to kick on when it, for some reason, got 30 degrees in, in March again or May again and my wife wants the furnace on. I don't want to know how to fix the pilot light so that it'll actually light so the furnace will kick on and heat the house. I really don't want to know that. But somebody has to know that in the house, right? I don't want to know how to crawl under my sink and, and, and repair the fact that the basket, the drain basket is now leaking, which I had to do two weeks ago, and it's been leaking since I installed it. Another thing I didn't want to know how to do, but I looked it up on YouTube and got it done, right? I don't want to know how to do that because I just want it to be fixed. I don't want to be the one to fix it. I, I don't want to know how to hang 400 pictures properly and make them straight and make them look good just so my wife can decide the next day, I don't like those there. Let's move them over here. Can I get an amen? All the wives just got really quiet right there. Joe's got my back back there in the back. It's just, I don't want to know this stuff, to be perfectly honest. But you know what? Somebody has to. And that responsibility falls to us dads. And most of us, if we're perfectly honest with ourselves, we probably at some point or another come to the point that we realize we don't know everything. We are not necessarily enough for every challenge and every problem that is before us. Listen, there are people out there 
who believe that they're enough and who in every situation feel confident about everything, who believe that they have the answer not only to their own problems, but all the world's problems. I've known a few of these people. We call them narcissists, and they're really kind of annoying at times. Amen? But they seem to have it all figured out. But if we're honest, most of us would come to the place where we recognize that we are not always enough. And you know what? The concept is biblical. The truth of the matter is we're not enough. Look at Romans 3.23, the lone scripture I'm going to put on the screen. I'll refer to a couple other ones today, but Romans 3.23 says this, For everyone has sin. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Listen. Since Adam and Eve chose in the garden to disobey God, we have all, all of us, have been falling short from that day forward. We've all gotten in the habit of not necessarily being enough. In fact, we aren't enough from that moment forward in time. Since the fall, none of us are always enough. You see, we were created by God for a perfect relationship with Him. And when we were walking with God, as Adam and Eve were walking with God, the Bible describes this beautiful situation where they're living in the Garden of Eden, a place God created for them. And they're walking with God in the cool of the afternoon, having regular conversations with Him, knowing him just like I know my wife or just like I know Pat. And they spent time with God and everything was good and there were no problems to solve and there was nothing facing Adam and Eve that they couldn't handle. In that situation, before there was sin, they were enough because they were one with the one who is enough. But after they fell, after Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, suddenly there was something that entered into their life that they could not handle by themselves. And the evidence of it comes just a few verses after they take the fruit, when God comes walking through the garden looking for them. And suddenly Adam and Eve are like, oh no, God's coming. Wait a minute, why have we never felt like this before? Why are we suddenly intimidated that God is coming? Oh yeah, we're naked, right? We never noticed that before. And so they run around and they try to cover themselves using fig leaves, the Bible says. Must have been some big fig leaves. I don't know about you, but I I can imagine if they tried to thread those together and cover themselves, how that went. And so as God came into their presence, they're standing there with this problem they can't fix. And, And to us, it might seem like the smallest of all the problems that would come thereafter. But they are standing naked before the Creator and they are ashamed and they don't know what to do about it. And so God in his love and mercy, the one who is enough, looks at the ones who aren't enough, who can't fix it, who can't deal with it on their own any longer because of the separation between them and God. And the Bible says in in chapter 3, verse 21, that he took the life of an animal and he made clothes out of the animal's hide for for the man and the woman. And he took care of their problem. You see, in the first moments when they were no longer enough, God became enough and he helped them with their problems. The fact of the matter is, friends, we are, none of us, always enough. From from that day forward, when they separated from God, our separation from God has caused us to need, to fall short. We are not enough because of our sin. And as hard as we try to become all that people need us to be, as much as we strive to be all that everyone needs us to be, there are going to be times when we have to be honest and admit to ourselves that we are not enough to be all things to all people. And it is in these moments that we recognize, when we recognize that we're not enough, that we realize that we are in need of someone who is. And that someone, of course, is God. It is Christ. It is him. So for all you dads out there who don't feel like enough, or maybe you're not a dad and you still feel that pain sometimes of wishing you could do better, wishing you could do more, wishing you had the answers, understand that even if we're not enough, and we aren't, we can know the one who is. Fathers, if you're struggling with the fact that at times you don't have the right answer or maybe that you lack the skills needed, which I find myself frequently in that situation, or that you feel like a failure because you couldn't be all things to all people, it's okay. Since the fall of man, no man or woman or child has ever been enough. And the only hope that we have of ever being enough is to partner with the one who is enough. In fact, in Ephesians 1.23, Paul describes Jesus this way. He says, he is the one who fills all things everywhere. 
with himself. He is the one who fills all things everywhere with himself. So dads, if you're struggling with not being enough today, let me tell you how to be enough. Fill your life with the one who is all things everywhere, all the time, and that is Jesus. Because the more we walk with him, the more we will find that we can handle in this world of ours. Jesus is the one that we need to walk with. Now, if you're not a father today, I want to help you with what to to get your father for Father's Day. Isn't that the age-old question we all struggle with about this time of year? Most of you are saying you should have given me this device yesterday. This device, this advice, let's use words properly, Mr. Jeff. Um, Advice yesterday, how many of you shopped for your father already? How many of you don't shop for your father? You're just going to let him leave him out there to dry. Yeah, there's, there's a few. How many of you just don't want to think about this because you forgot about it and you're sitting next to the guy? You just don't want to even do that. You're just not going to give me anything this morning, are you? I'm just going to sit up here and go. Anyway, if you're not a father today, let me help you with the age-old question of what to get your father for Father's Day. Now, there are some frivolous things that you could get your father that might make him happy. One is certainly a big screen TV. How big, you say? Just a little bit bigger than the neighbor's. Number two, zero-turn lawnmower. Zero-turn lawnmower. How big, you say? How wide should the cut be? Once again, just a little bit bigger than the neighbor. That's all you need. I don't care how big your yard is. That's not what it depends on. It depends on how big your neighbor's mower is. So, um, I mean, this is just kind of a frivolous one I threw in kind of at the end. I mean, a tractor with a front end loader. I mean, it's just some dads need that. You know, I might someday. John has one, I think, so he's good, but anyway. Okay, those are the frivolous things. Let me tell you what to really give your dad, and this is in all seriousness. And some of you can do this because you still have your dad's. I can't because mine's gone. So this is advice from me wishing I still had a dad to do this for, so hear this from me. When your dad is enough, When he does have the answer, when he's able to fix your problem, and when he gives you good advice, make sure that you tell him that he was enough in that moment for that situation and that you appreciate all that he has to offer. Make sure and tell him that. Because you see, as our kids get older, as dads and even as moms, we are basically in the business at that point of working ourselves out of a job. We want our kids at some point to fire us from being their full-time parents, amen? Because we don't want them to live in our house forever, right? We want them to come around. We want them to be a part of our lives. But we want to work ourselves out of a job. We all wish to be fired from full-time parenting at some point or another in their lives. And as they go out and as they do their own thing, there are going to be times in their lives and in your life as a father where you start to wonder, did I do the right job? Did I get it done? Am I qualified even to help out? Because you see, as we get fired from our jobs as full-time parents, and they become problem solvers for themselves, if we are lucky, maybe just maybe, as they go off on their own and they leave us behind, maybe just maybe our kids, even though we don't need to be there full-time, maybe they will hire us back as consultants once in a great while. How many of you would welcome that? Consultancy. I certainly would. When your dad has the right answer, when he has the knowledge and the wisdom that you need, when he becomes the encourager that you need him to be, tell him how much you appreciate it. That is the best Father's Day I think you could probably give any dad. Pray with me. Our Father, today... We honor our fathers, some of whom are still walking this earth, and we have the opportunity to encourage them and and build them up and thank them for all that they've done to make us the people that we've become. Others have gone on to be with you and are no longer walking this earth, and all we can do is essentially ponder and remember and think about the good times we had with them. But Father, however we choose to celebrate Father's Day, I pray that you would help us to understand that none of us are really enough unless we're walking side by side with you 
in relationship. It is only when the relationship with our Heavenly Father is restored that we become people who no longer fall short of your glory. And we actually become your children according to Scripture. Father, it's, it's so ironic and so encouraging that throughout Scripture you are pictured as a Heavenly Father. And I know that image isn't always good for everyone. But for those of us who did have loving parents or loving fathers... It's an incredible example to us of what we should be and what we can be. Help us to walk closely with you, God, knowing that that's the only way we will ever be enough for every situation. And God, as we think about the dads we still have with us, help us today to encourage them and, and to build them up so that they will continue to be consultants in our lives gladly and faithfully throughout the rest of our days or theirs. God, we thank you for being our Heavenly Father. May this day remind us of you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. I've already said enough snarky things, so I don't have anything else for you. Have a great day.